The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Mother of us all. Amen. Today is the last Sunday of the church year, the last Sunday before Advent, which means today is also the Feast of the Reign of Christ, or known as the Feast of Christ the King. I want to jump right into the history of this feast day uh, because I find it fascinating because I like to nerd out on European modern history, <laughs> which this feast is all about. Christ the King, or the reign of Christ, feels like a feast that has been around forever. Surely it has always been the case that the church celebrated the last Sunday before Advent with something special, and why not Christ the King? But in fact, this feast was only founded in the year 1925 by Pope Pius XI in the Roman Catholic Church. And Pius wrote an encyclical uh, or talking about his arguments for founding this feast and why he thought it was important uh, at his time. And the purpose for that, he was very clear about he was concerned about the rise of modern authoritarianisms in European governments, both fascist and communist, and all over a rise in narrow nationalism. Of particular concern for him, as he was sitting in the Vatican in Rome, was the rise of a particular political figure who was uh, rising in power in Italy that you might have heard, not, might have heard of uh, named Benito Mussolini. It was in response to this new form of politics, anti-democratic, more authoritarian, and also completely detached from any kind of religion that the Pope was concerned about because the figures that were rising in these movements were themselves casting themselves as sort of Messiah figures, new Christ, the second coming. And the Pope's concern, the reason for establishing this feast, was to sort of inoculate Christians against this new form of politics. Christians should not, of all people, fall for this kind of politics. Because there is only one king, only one Lord, to which we owe absolute allegiance, and that is Jesus Christ. Because concern about this kind of politics was shared across all of Christianity, this feast was quickly adopted beyond the Roman Catholic Church, including among uh, Lutherans and Methodists and we Anglicans slash Episcopalians. It's one of the reasons why I really find this feast important, because we continually need this inoculation against a politics that is about personality cults and about authoritarianism rather than the common good. But at the same time, I also want to acknowledge what Pius got wrong, because Pius also failed to acknowledge the church's own role, the institutional church's own role in creating the conditions of inequality and desperation that led to the political revolutions that ravaged Europe in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Because the church, as we know, had a history of siding with the moneyed classes and the powerful classes against the poor and the marginalized. And the church sided itself with whoever would protect its own interests. Okay, thank you for letting me nerd out about that for a little <laughs> bit. I could go on all day. One little bit of history left is that uh, originally this feast was uh, scheduled for the 
end of October, uh, which is also when Protestants tend to celebrate Reformation Day, uh, Vatican II moved this feast to when we celebrate it now, on the last Sunday before Advent starts, which adds this rich apocalyptic character to, the, to today's feast as well. Not just about Christ as king, but Christ as king who will come again. We're going to come back to that apocalyptic stuff in a second. But this feast means, even if we really, really try to resist it, it means that today is inescapably a feast about politics and about government. And I want to acknowledge that there are very understandable and legitimate reasons when we get nervous and don't want to talk about politics in church. One, we want church to be a refuge. We want to come here on Sunday and feel comfort, reassurance, a break and a rest, a Sabbath from all of the mess going, out, going on out there and especially in the kind of media landscape that we live in, the overexposure we have to the rancorous politics that have overtaken us in recent years. Second, we also know that we don't all agree on the politics of the day. This, in fact, I'll just acknowledge, you know, I have spent most of my career serving in uh, churches in very large cities, and to be quite frank, the politics was usually pretty aligned. This is the most politically diverse congregation I have ever served, and I'm very aware of that and very um, excited about that, actually, because there's a real opportunity there that I want to talk about in a second. But because we don't all agree, all agree on where we stand on, on any given issue of the day, there is a kind of anxiety that comes with talking about them because we don't want to split apart, right? We don't want to make our church fall apart because we, we uh, have disagreements about the things going on in politics around us. And so it feels safer to just like, let's just not bring it up, right? Let's avoid the topic altogether. And that's quite understandable. The third reason I can think of is that nobody wants their morality or their politics dictated to them. I'm also very aware, I am standing up here in fancy robes, with my fancy book. I'm in a position of authority, and there's something kind of unfair about me telling you what you should think and what you should feel about issues going on in the day, especially if you feel very passionately about them. And I try to, and I've gotten better about this, I used to be a very, very uh, angry preacher um, <laughs> in my youth. <laughs> it's, I mean, it's just a phase, you have to go through it, right? Um, to be aware that there is that power differential between the preacher, you're stuck there listening to me, and is it fair for me to tell you this is, this is what Jesus would say about this political issue, as opposed to creating other kinds of spaces where we're more equal, we can share together our different perspectives. There are other reasons why we might get nervous or um, want to avoid talking about politics in church. And at the same time, and not disregarding any of those and using those as a guide, there are some reasons why we just can't avoid talking about certain things in church. We can't pretend that the stuff going on out there isn't happening and that we come in here and kind of enter a fantasy world where these things aren't on our minds. And indeed, the need to come and seek refuge is precisely perhaps what we can provide a different way of thinking about the things that are most on our minds in a way that doesn't make us feel anxious or fearful about the future. The other thing is that our faith should inform. It should be in conversation with what we do out in the political sphere. Jesus has something to say about the issues that are presented to us in our current day. Jesus' teachings are themselves political. They're not just spiritual. They had resonance and they had teeth for the politics of his own day. And as evidence for the fact that Jesus' teachings were political, I submit only the cross. 
He was killed by the political leaders of his day. That's how we know that what he was saying had political impact. But finally, and most importantly, why we can't avoid talking about politics in church is because we actually, here in this space, have so much common ground. We have so many values that we hold, to, hold in common. We have so much in terms of worldview that we hold in common because of our common faith. And if we can't have productive conversations in here, in this space, among one another, then I don't know what hope there is for everyone else out there. And that's why I say there's a real opportunity here. There's an opportunity to have conversations that are radically different from the conversations that happen among politicians, if you can call those conversations, out in social media, in the traditional media, and most importantly, at our Thanksgiving dinners. That was a joke. <laughs> and the, re the way, and by the way, we're not, I'm not gonna talk about any particular issue today. I'm, I'm giving a framework, I'm giving a, a ground, a, a basis for what we might use later on. And that's, that's the idea I wanna give to you today, is that we are able to have very different kinds of conversations about politics because we have the riches of our faith and the riches of our tradition to draw upon that other people, when they're talking about politics, don't have, that they can't use, that they can't bring to bear when they're engaged in a conversation and trying to understand each other's perspectives. So today, I want to offer one option. I want to offer one option, a framework, a foundation, a, a, uh, some uh, heuristic for how we might go about having tense, uncomfortable conversations uh, in the future, if we elect to do so. And what I want to offer to you is some of the iconography around Christ as King itself for this feast day. So I want you to turn to your front cover, to the icon that we have chosen for today. This icon is uh, referred to as Christ uh, Pantocrator, uh, Pantocrator perhaps, um, which is a Greek word, pan, krator, all pan as in pandemic, and krator as in democracy, autocracy, krator. It is Christ, the ruler of all, is what this icon is depicting. And it's also my preferred title for this feast day, um, if we were in a Greek-speaking context. Um, it's a very old icon, 6th century at least, Byzantine, um, and it's housed at St. Catherine's Monastery in, uh, at Mount Sinai. Now you'll notice this is supposed to be a depiction of Christ the King, Christ the ruler of all, but he does not have a crown, he does not have a scepter, he does not have any of the, tradition or the uh, secular uh, political trappings of power, Instead, he has a very thick book, and he has a hand extended in a gesture of blessing. But here's the really remarkable thing about this icon. So try this. So hold up the icon, and if you uh, are online, make sure to scroll up, and you can do this on your screen. Use your right hand and cover one half of Jesus' face, okay? And look at his features. His brow is soft, his eyes are wide, his mouth is gentle. His, this is a face of, of gentleness, of comfort, of um, softness. Now try the other side. Take your left hand and cover the left side of Jesus' face. And what do you see? I see an uh, arched eyebrow, like Mr. Spock. His eyes are fiery. His mouth is frowning. His features are sharp. This is a harder depiction of Christ. He is too 
faced. And in fact, if you Google uh, this image, Christ Pantocrator, uh, later on, people have actually put this into Photoshop and doubled the other side. So you can actually see these are two very different faces on Jesus. And there's been lots of interpretations about why this icon is the way it is. What is with these two different faces? Uh, and one of the traditional uh, interpretations is that the left side is the human side and the right side is his divine side, the two natures of Christ, human and divine. Uh, others have interpreted it as Christ the merciful on the left and Christ the judge, the judge on the right. I want to offer a different interpretation. That the left signifies Christ as Alpha and the right as Christ Omega. In the book of Revelation, Christ, when he comes in glory, says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Jesus, as ruler of all, this is how he identifies himself, as the beginning and the end the Alpha, and the Omega. So go ahead and put your right hand over the right side of Jesus' face again and look at that gentle side. I want to offer Jesus as Alpha in this way, what this means might mean for us. Jesus as the foundation of all politics. At that beginning, Christ through Christ all things were made. Acknowledging Christ as Omega means acknowledging and remembering and upholding the created goodness of all persons. Of all persons. Absolutely every person. We are called to remember that every person is made in the image of God and bears the image of God. Whether they are our fiercest opponent in a debate whether they are the subject of new policies, whatever conversations we have in politics, whatever policies we adopt, whatever candidates we support, we have to start from this assumption as followers of Christ, the created goodness of all persons, and to withdraw from any politics that becomes about denying the humanity of any person or any people. And it's not just about faking warm feelings for other people when we do this. It's about trusting in God as creator. Trusting in God that that image of God is born by us. And that by Jesus, every living thing was created in love. That is our ultimate common ground from which every other conversation needs to start and can be uh, built upon. Now switch over. Switch your hand to the other side. Christ as Omega, the end, the goal of all politics. And the goal of all politics is given by Jesus in today's gospel itself. Jesus is a demanding and exacting judge. The book that he holds on that side of his body is actually a book of Gospels. That is the law by which we are to be judged at the end. And Jesus does take sides. We heard it. He would, was not flinching. Jesus takes the side of the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and the prisoner, the powerless, the hopeless, the outcast, and the marginalized. Jesus says, whatever you do or don't do to the least of these, you do to me. His question to us at the end is, were you on their side too? Is that what you were working toward? That is the law in the kingdom of God and in the reign of Christ. And so the question for us is not whether or not to be on their side too. The most important question is what are the best things we ought to do to be on their side? Okay. Now take your hands off and look at the whole face once more. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning 
and the end. The tough thing, friends, the really tough thing is holding these together and living in between them. We are not at the beginning. We are not at the end. And yet Jesus has tasked us, empowered us, to find the ways of connecting those two things together. And we have so much freedom, so much freedom to figure out what to do about that. So much freedom to figure out the best ways of living so that we both acknowledge the created goodness of all persons and we work towards that goal of siding with those who are most oppressed and disempowered. And if we can get clear on those basic assumptions, the basic assumptions about the value of each and every human life and on what God's purpose is for us in siding with the least among us, then we can have political conversations actually worth having that actually move us towards something, that actually allow us to come together in shared work. Because we're not having those conversations in order to win, in order to win the debate and to vanquish our opponents. We are having those conversations in order to do God's work. Now, friends, I don't have any specific things I'm planning for what we're going to talk about. I don't know. Next year, I got, I got a budget to put together. That's my goal for the next few weeks. Uh, we have business to conclude. We have children's formation programs to build. But I at least wanted to get it in our system a little bit to be a little less anxious and a little bit more creative and imaginative about what talking about politics in church might look like and to not get panicked if we decide we need to have some forums about particular issues in the future. And at the very least, even if we don't have such forums here, I hope you can at least carry some of this with you as we now enter a presidential election year, as the politics is only going to get more rancorous, I assure you. A practice for yourself of holding together Christ as Alpha and Omega. Because at the end of the day, it's our loyalty to Christ as King that gives us the stability and steadfastness through all of the the bitter rhetoric of politics from one politician to the next, from one candidate to the next. We must always press onward and walk forward to that country that Christ is preparing for us, that country where there is no more sorrow or weeping, there are no more sick, or suffering, naked, or imprisoned, but only a kingdom of God's blessing and abundance and life eternal. Amen. Amen. Let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 